Okay, in the last lecture for Monday, we went over the mechanism of free radical halogenation, which had six steps. An initiation step, two propagation steps, and then three termination steps. And we saw how to write the half arrows for the reactions for basically the movements of a single electron how to write the transition states for those um, reactions, and then talked a little bit about the basics of the mechanism, the difference between intermediates, transition states, and how to write reaction coordinate diagrams. Now, we're going to come back to that after the first exam. But what I now want to talk about is how you predict the products, or how you write the possible products of free radical halogenation. So in this case, if we're looking at free radical halogenation of methane, so I'm going to take the CH4 and I'm going to react it with Cl2 in the presence of light or heat. And we'll find out next week that the difference between those, there's a big difference between using just light or using heat. But what I'm going to end up doing is substituting from the alkanes perspective, I'm going to substitute a hydrogen for a chlorine. So I'm going to end up forming, in this case, chloromethane and HCl by our substitution. Now we're going to deal with situations where I'm going to do monochlorination only or monobromination. So in other words, I'm just going to replace a single hydrogen on the molecule with the halogen. And so let's make it a little bit more complicated here, and let's use ethane and do chlorination of ethane with light. How many possible products are there for this reaction? And remember, what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute a hydrogen with a chlorine. Well, if you said that there was only one possible product of that reaction, namely one chloroethane or ethyl chloride, you're right. But how do you come up with that? Well, let's take the two CH3 groups and let's explicitly write out the Lewis dot structure. And when I react this with chlorine gas, what I'm going to end up doing is replacing one of these hydrogens with a chlorine. Well, it doesn't matter in this case whether it's any of these hydrogens. That would give me this product, which is 1-chloroethane. It wouldn't matter if I replaced any of these three hydrogens with a chlorine, because that's going to give me still 1-chloroethane. So when we're doing free radical halogenations, before we get to some of the more complicated things of next week, we have to be able to predict and write how many possible products we could get for monohalogenation. For ethane, there's only one. Now, let's make it a little bit more complicated, and let's do propane. If I was to chlorinate propane in the presence of light, how many different products would I get? And let me define different here for a minute. How many, many products do I get that are structural isomers of each other? What does it mean to be a structural isomer? Same molecular formula, but different connections of, of the atoms. Structural isomers have different names. So how many possible products are there for the chlorination of, of propane? How many different products can we get? Can you write them? Can you name them? Okay. Well, if you're overly ambitious, stop the tape and try it. If you're not so overly ambitious and you want to see an example problem, well, here it is. Now, if I replace any one of those three hydrogens, I'm going to get 1-chloropropane. 
but I'm also going to get one chloropropane if I if I substitute for any of those three hydrogens on the methyl group, right? I'm going to get the same product. And how do I know they're the same product? How do I know that they're the same structural isomer because they have the same IUPAC name? I'm going to make one chloropropane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call both of these. I'm going to say A. This gives me product A, 1-chloropropane. Now what if I replace one of the two hydrogens on the carbon in the middle? What do I get? I get this. Is that a new product? That's 2-chloropropane. So I get that product, and I'm going to go ahead and label this as B. So here's the B product. So I get two possible products for this reaction. One chloropropane and two chloropropane. How about the number of possible products for this? Can you write them out? Can you name them? Well, I would say that if I replace any of the methyl group hydrogens, I'm going to get product A. And if I replace any of the CH2s, I'm going to get product B. So what are my two possible products here? My two possible products are one chlorobutane and Two chlorobutane. Okay, so two possible products there. Okay, let's increase the difficulty here with one of my favorite problems. And now let's do bromination. How many possible products, or how many unique products, do I get for the bromination of 2-methylbutane? Okay. Take a minute, draw them all out, and let's see if you get them all. I want the unique number of products. How many are there? Well, let's see. If I replace any of those three CH3s, I get this product. So we'll call that product A. If I replace that CH, which I'll call B, I'm going to get product B. If I replace the CH2, I'm going to get product C. And if I replace the CH3 here, do I get a different product than replacing one of the hydrogens on CH3A? Well, I think you do. Now, here we have, so here we have products with where we substituted it at what I call position A, position B, position C, position D. Are all four of those products different structural isomers? Do they have different names? Well, I would look at A and I would say that A is 1-bromo-2-methylbutane. Product B is 2-bromo-2-methylbutane. Product C is 2-methyl or 2-bromo-3-methylbutane. 
and product D is 1-bromo-3-methylbutane. So all four of those have different IUPAC names, and so therefore they're different structural isomers. Now, what about this methyl group here? Is that going to give me a new product, or is, have I already written that product? This is the point of confusion where normally 50% of the people will say it's a new product and 50% of the people will say no, it's the same as product A. But then some people say the product D is the same as product A. Are methyl groups different? Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. So is this a new product? No, it's not. Because if I was to name this product, if I would give, it would have... If I give you this on the test on Friday, I would number this 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so this would be 1-bromo-2-methylbutane, just like product A, 1-bromo-2-methylbutane. So it turns out that that is also, it gives the same product. Bromination at that CH3 group will also give me the same product as I get with the other methyl group. But the methyl group that I've labeled D, that gives a completely different product. Okay, so there are four possible products of this reaction. Okay. How about this one? How many different possible products are there if I now brominate this product or this alkane? Take a minute, write them down, count them up. How many different possible products are there from this reaction? write them out well I would if I call these two methyl groups right here a these two B C and D there's four possible products of this reaction Here's the first one, call product A, here's product B, here's product C, Here's product B, or D, sorry. Okay. If we name those, we're going to get different names. For instance, 1-bromo, 3-methyl, pentane. 2-bromo-3-methylpentane, 3-bromo-3-methylpentane, 1-bromo-2-ethylbutane. And if we would have brominated at these two positions, I would have gotten the same products that I've listed here for products A and B. Okay. So, when we do monobromination on an alkane, we're substituting a bromine or a chlorine if we're doing monochlorination. We're going to substitute the hydrogen with a halogen.
the first thing we need to know is how many unique products do I get? How many different structural isomers do I get? And once I know the answer to that question, then of course the next problem that we have to deal with is, so are they all formed in the same percentage? Are they formed in different percentages? Is it just random? Is there a system? What's what we call the major product of the reaction, the per product of the highest percentage? What are the minor products? And how do I tell? Or is this just all random and we pretty much don't know? Well, if the last was the case where we don't know and it was pretty much random, we could move on. And we wouldn't have to worry about next week's lectures. But unfortunately, there's a system. And so we have to learn about that system. And we have to learn why that system works. Okay. Now let me go back here for a minute. And let's go back to our butane problem. Or, sorry, our propane problem. And let's go ahead and let's brominate that propane. Well, we know we got two possible products. One bromopropane and two bromopropane. So this is nice and simple. We got products A and product B. Now let's ask ourselves, which one of these two is the major product? Which one's formed in the highest percentage? There's two ways I can look at the answer to that question. The first is to look at what, what I call statistics. And when I look at statistics, I know that I'm going to replace a hydrogen with a bromine. Well, it turns out that there are six hydrogens that will give me product A. And there are two hydrogens that give me product B. And so statistics will play a role because there's three times as many hydrogens that give product A as there are that give product B. So that's going to play a role. Does that mean that product A is the major product of this reaction? Mm, not necessarily. It would if the statistics were totally driving the process. But they're not. Well, sometimes they are. But they're not right at the moment. The thing we have to balance against that is what's called selectivity. And in selectivity, let's look at the two intermediates that give product A and product B. Well, going through the mechanism, this radical leads to product A. And this radical leads to product B. Now is there a difference in the stability of those two radicals? Sure. This is a primary radical and this is a secondary radical. Which one is more stable? The secondary is more stable. Does that mean that the secondary radical is going to form more product than the primary? Does the, does the more stable intermediate always give more product than the less stable intermediate? Well, if your gut instinct is yes, you're right. Now, this selectivity competes against statistics because in order to form the more stable radical, you needed to have less hydrogens at that position. So the idea of forming more product from the more stable intermediate goes against the statistics. But if your gut tells you, yeah, I think I get more product, all things being equal, statistics being equal, I would get more product from the more stable intermediate, your gut's right. 
But why? Well, if I start out with a carbon-hydrogen bond as my reactants, so I'm going to go back and draw a reaction coordinate diagram. I'm going to go through a transition state to give me an intermediate. The intermediate is going to be the free radical. And then the free radical is going to react with the bromine or the chlorine to then give me the final product. And we know what these two transition states are, but I'm not going to worry about them at the, for the moment. Now, if I was to compare forming a secondary radical versus forming a primary radical, the alkanes are going to start out at the same energy level. Okay, whether this is, if this is propane, then it's the same starting reactant but the radicals are going to have different energies. So let's draw that out. Let's say I do have a secondary radical versus the possibility of forming a primary radical. That goes through a transition state and it's going to form the primary radical. Now where on this reaction coordinate diagram, where on the energy is the secondary radical going to show up? Is it going to have higher energy or lower energy? If it's more stable, it's going to have lower energy. So that means that my secondary radical is going to be at a lower energy. Okay, and this diagram is not drawn to scale. Okay, but it'll be at a lower energy. What does that mean for the transition state energy? Well, what it means for the transition state energy is the more stable the product, it turns out the lower the transition state energy. And so therefore, there's a difference in activation energies. The more stable product actually goes through a more stable transition state and therefore it has a lower activation energy. So the more stable the intermediate, the lower the activation energy to get to that intermediate. Okay, Then that's something that's loosely translated as Hammond's postulate. But you can actually do this with a piece of paper and I'll splice in a video or I'll put a separate video um, online showing how you can see that. But just accept for the fact, for the moment, the fact that if you have a, a more stable intermediate, a secondary radical, it's going to go through a lower activation, en lower activation energy to make it. Okay, right, so you're with me so far. The primary radical is going to have a higher activation energy. The more stable secondary radical is going to have a lower activation energy. Which one's going to form faster? If you said the secondary radical, you're right. Why? Well, it's got a lower activation energy. Where did I learn that? General chemistry. I learned that from something called the Arrhenius equation, which says that the rate of a reaction is equal to some k value times e to the minus ea over rt. What's ea? The activation energy. So the rate of forming a secondary radical is going to be faster than the rate of forming the primary radical because the activation energy for the secondary radical is going to be more it's going to be lower than the activation energy for forming the primary radical so the secondary radical is going to form faster which means then 
that once I form the secondary radical, I'm going to get more product B than product A. If there are the same number of hydrogens at each of, at those two positions. Okay. So if I had the same number of primaries and the same number of secondaries, I would actually get more secondary because I go through the more stable intermediate faster than the less stable intermediate. And this is what we call selectivity. The reaction is going to be more selective towards the formation of the more stable radical than it will be towards the less stable radical. Okay. All right, so hopefully you're with me. But that still doesn't take into account the fact that these two are fighting each other, statistics and selectivities. And we'll have to get into the reasons for that. The reason the reasons for them fighting each well, the reasons for them fighting each other should be relatively clear. The more hydrogens you have, the weaker or the less stable the radical you form. The more the less hydrogens, the more stable the radical. So they're going to constantly be at odds. But here's what people did. They decided to combine the two of them together and actually calculate then what we call the selectivity that's going to be independent of statistics. And so what they did was this. They took a reaction and they took something like isobutane and they brominated it at room temperature with light. That's what the RT stands for is room temperature. So they brominated it at room temperature with light and then they measured the amount of products that they got. The amount of primary product, the amount of product that came from the primary radical versus the amount of product that they formed from, in this case, the tertiary radical. Okay, so this came from a primary radical. This one came from a tertiary radical. Now the product, the ratio of these two products takes into account both the statistical advantage that bromination at the primary at the primary position has over bromination at the tertiary position. So what they did was they calculated a formula and they said, you know what? The basically the percentage of and I'm going to call these products, I'm going to call these A and B, A and B. So coming from pr position A and coming from position B. So they said, well, you know, the percentage of product B relative to the percentage of product A is going to be influenced by a couple of things, the statistics and the selectivity. And so what they would say is, well, the percentage of product B is going to be influenced by both of those. So let's normalize the, let's normalize the statistics. So in other words, let's get rid of the statistics. How do you do that? Well, you take the percentage of B and you divide it through by the number of hydrogens that gives you product B. So they said, I'm going to divide that through by the number of hydrogens. And then for product A, I'm going to divide through by the number of hydrogens that give product A, which in this case would be 9. And that's going to give me what I call the selectivity of the tertiary position over then the selectivity or relative to the selectivity of brominating at the primary position. So they normalized by dividing through by the number of hydrogens that gives you that product. In this case, they would have taken the pro percentage of B, divided through by 1, taken the percentage A, divided through by 9, 
and then that would give me the selectivity of a tertiary position relative to the selectivity of a primary position. Now what do these selectivities really mean? How fast do I form a tertiary radical relative to how fast do I form a primary radical? That's what it really means. The selectivities are, in essence, the rate of forming a tertiary radical over the rate of forming the primary radical. So when people made these measurements, they did all sorts of compounds. And these are all ratios. So what they did was they took the ratios relative to a primary position. And so they did this for chlorination and for bromination. And they got the selectivities, the rates of forming the tertiary radicals over the rates of forming the secondary radicals. And then they kind of came up with an average. Okay. Well, when they did that, they did this for both the radicals, forming the radicals at room temperature as well as forming the radicals at high temperatures. But let's just deal with room temperature light reactions first. Okay, so they, they did these reactions, they calculated, they determined the percentages, maybe they injected them into a gas chromatograph and got the percentages of the two products, and then they divided through by the number of hydrogens to remove the statistics. And here's what they found, roughly. And these are what we call the selectivities. So these are the rates of forming the different radicals relative to each other with the statistics removed. So normalized for statistics. What they found was that at room temperature, when you did bromination, and at room temperature when you did chlorination, you got the following two ratios. I'm going to start with chlorine first. They found that you formed a tertiary radical five times faster, 3.4 times faster relative to the primary. So this is the ratio of the tertiary radical to the secondary radical to the primary radical. And so you form a tertiary radical five times faster than a primary radical. You form in chlorination a secondary radical 3.4 times faster than a primary radical. And since this is all relative, we say that you form a primary radical you know, relative to itself one. So you form tertiary faster than secondary, faster than primary, at a rates of 5 to 3.4 to 1. Now for bromine, it changed. And the change we'll get into next week. But for bromine, they found that they formed a secondary radical 1,700 times faster and a secondary radical 80 times faster than a primary radical. So you really, there's a real big difference between the tertiary, secondary, and primary radicals in bromination. And there's still a difference at for the chlorination at 5 to 3.4 to 1. Okay, now these are with the statistics normalized. So if I go back to my selectivity, my equation here, where I said, well, my percentage of B over the number of hydrogens that give me product B over the percentage of A over the number of hydrogens that give me product A is equal to the selectivity at to form product B or to form the secondary or in this case the tertiary radical over the selectivity of forming product A, which came from a primary radical, 
I'm in a position now where I could rearrange this equation so that if I know the selectivity and I know the number of hydrogens, I can predict the percentages of B to A. And so the way we do this is, since this is the number of hydrogens that gave product B and this is the number of hydrogens that gave product A, when I rewrite this equation, the percentage of B equals the selectivity of that position times the number of hydrogens that give me product B. And the percentage of A then is equal to the selectivity at position A, whether it's primary, secondary, tertiary, times the number of hydrogens that give me product A. So re, if we redo this, if we rewrite these equations then, if I know what the selectivities are, which I do from here, from all this data that's been collected and averaged, if I know the selectivities and I know the number of hydrogens that can be replaced in the molecule, then I can calculate the ratios of the different products that are formed in the reaction. And I'll show you how we do that in a, in a moment. But I said that the data is calculated not only just for room temperature um, halogenation, usually, usually using light, but it was also done at high temperatures, in other words, greater than 300 degrees Celsius, which is going to be mostly under heat conditions. And in that case, what they found was that for bromination and chlorination, that you had the same, selectivi same selectivities for primary, secondary, and tertiary positions. In other words, they were one to one to one. And what that means is, is that at high temperatures, the rates of forming tertiary radicals, secondary radicals, and primary radicals are nearly identical. Now, we'll get into the reasons for that next week. But right now, I just want to do a couple of examples here of using these equations to calculate then what the major product of a reaction would be given these selectivities. And then we'll get into more detail about the selectivities um, next week after the test. So let's say that I go back to the idea of doing the propane. How could I calculate the percentages or the ratios are more accurate of, let's say, chlorinating propane at room temperature. So I'm going to chlorinate at light at room temperature. What products do I predict? Well, I first of all have to predict the products that I would get, one chloropropane and two chloropropane. Now, can we calculate the ratios of these? Well, calculating ratios is relatively straightforward. I'm going to take the selectivity and multiply it by the number of hydrogens. So if I come over here, I have these two methyl groups substituting a chlorine for a hydrogen on those two methyl groups. It gives me product A. Substituting for one of the hydrogens at B here gives me product B. So what I have to do is come over here and look. Well, what kind of hydrogens am I replacing to give me product A? They're primary. How many total hydrogens are there that give me product A? Well, there's three, six. So I have the selectivity for primary of forming a primary radical chlorination at room temperature times six hydrogens. And that's going to give me the ratio, or actually the percentage, I guess, if you want to think of, for forming product A. For product B, I'm going to have the selectivity of a, forming a secondary radical for chlorination at room temperature times the number of hydrogens that would give me product B, which turns out to be two. So now we just plug in the numbers. For a primary position, the rate of forming a radical is always relative to that primary radical. So I've got 1 times 6, so I've got a 6. For the secondary, that was 3.4.
So 3.4 times 2 gives me 6.8. So if I do chlorination at room temperature, my theoretical values would be a 6 to 6.8 ratio of the two products. Now what I'm really interested in is which product is going to be the major product. It's going to be the product with the largest number in that product. And so it's going the major product is going to be 2 chloro propane. Okay. If I wanted to know the percentage of product B, the percentage of product B would be 6.8 divided by 6 plus 6.8 times 100. So I'd be a little more than 50%. Okay, and so that's how we can get our theoretical values and predict what the major product of the chlorination reaction is. Now let's take a look at bromination. If I took propane and I brominate it at room temperature with light, I again I'm going to get the same two products, only this time with a bromine. So I'm going to get one bromo and two bromo propane. But now the percentages are going to change dramatically. I still have six hydrogens to give me product A, and the replacement of any of the two hydrogens gives me product B. But now look at what my selectivity times number of hydrogens will be. My percentage A is going to equal 1. The select, that's the selectivity or the ratio of forming a primary radical times the number of hydrogens, which is 6, which is still 6. But what happens in the secondary position with bromination? Well, if we go back to our selectivities, the bromination is 80 to 1. That means you form a secondary radical 80 times faster in bromination than a primary radical. And so now I'm going to get 80 times those two hydrogens gives me 160. And so clearly the major product of this reaction of bromination at room temperature is 2-chloropropate. And it's 160 out of 166 in terms of its percentage. So that's greater than 95% if I do the math in my head. Okay. So this is how we calculate what the major product of the reaction will be. We take the selectivities and multiply the number of hydrogens that give you that product. You'll always be given the selectivities. I don't, I'm not going to ask you to memorize those, although you will kind of learn them after a while. Okay. Let me do the last one here, which is, what if I took propane, oops, what if I took propane and I reacted it with chlorine or bromine at greater than 300 degrees Celsius? Well, I'd still get the two possible products, one chloro or one bromopropane. I'm going to go ahead and just put an X there and then I would get 2 chloro or bromopropane. Okay, and so again, I've got 6 hydrogens gives me product A. Replacement of either of the two hydrogens of product D, B, gives me, uh, the B hydrogens give me product B. But now in this case, the selectivities are going to be 1 to 1. And so in this case, I have 6 A hydrogens, so I'm going to get a 6, and I only have two hydrogens for B, so I'm going to get a two. So in this case, the major product actually switches. If I do halogenation at greater than 300 degrees Celsius, I'm going to get the majority of the one halo propane product. And so the question becomes, why do these selectivities change as a function of temperature? Why do they change? And you can see that that makes a dramatic difference. Why is bromination much more selective than chlorination is? Am I not forming the same secondary radical in both cases? 
why when I use a bromine is the reaction so much more selective and why does it form that secondary radical so much faster? Okay. So those are questions that we'll have to get to after the exam. Okay. And that'll be on the Monday after the exam. We'll talk about the reactions um, of the, we'll talk about how we get, uh, why selectivities change. Okay. So this is for Wednesday. So the online quiz um, will be basically online um, sometime on Monday, probably early afternoon. Okay. And the reading assignment is going to be the first, uh, probably the second parts of chapter four.